Hey, this debate's about to start, but in case you didn't know, it's also available on our Modern Day Debate podcast right now in case you want to listen to it on the go. So here is that debate right now. Hey everybody, today we're debating whether or not there is evidence for intelligent design and we are starting right now. Thank you. I'm Salvador Cordova. I run the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel and I'm a molecular biophysics researcher. I will be arguing that there is evidence for intelligent design and uh, just a little bit of self-promotion. I was recently voted by a panel of evolutionist uh, YouTubers as the number one YouTube creationist. So here is a picture of the bacterial uh, uh, flagellum motor, and uh, I'll be talking about why this, uh, why I feel this is one of the evidences of intelligent design that was provided uh, by a PIMO program uh, with a uh, professor I work with uh, in the field of uh, uh, protein research. So hats off to Dr. Deweese, uh, who's a associate professor at Lipscomb University and an adjunct professor at uh, Vanderbilt School of Medicine for that video. The uh, argument for, for, uh, for intelligent, uh, from an intelligent design appears to have begun with Socrates, uh, pagan philosopher. Um, that's according to the uh, Wikipedia entry on the teleological argument. Uh, the Christians have co-opted it, uh, most notably William Paley in the 18th and very early 19th century, he put forward the watchmaker argument. There is the classical design argument. It's uh, under the that Wiki, same Wikipedia entry on the teleological argument. The intelligent design argument is an ex- argument for the existence of God, or more generally, that, that complex functionality in the natural world, which looks designed, is evidence of an intelligent creator. And I mentioned Paley, those are his books. Uh, the famous one is on natural theology, which is an intelligent design argument. And he also wrote books on evidences of Christianity. That being said, the modern day intelligent design formulation is a little different than Paley's. It avoids or minimizes uh, the relation of intelligent design ID arguments to a deity that may be for political reasons. Plus there's also atheist ID and space alien ID. Um, but today I'll be arguing mostly uh, Paley's originally our original argument for design, uh, where he famously said, if we found a watch in the field, he actually used the word heat, but if we found a watch in the field, we would know that it was intelligently designed and not the product of, a, <clears throat> of an undirected environment. Uh, the design is identifiable without knowing when and exactly how the watch was made. In biology today, this is from a... Uh, article uh, written by a Nobel Prize winner, Aziz Sankar, uh, who is not an intelligent design advocate, so I'm not going to represent him as such. But he did point out, he wrote this article, The Intelligent Clock and the Rube Goldberg Clock, where he surveyed the clocks and watches that were found um, in biology. Uh, Some of the clocks in biology are very precise. Uh, That echolocation, uh, the sonar imaging that they use, so to speak, to be able to do their... um, to live requires uh, uh, the ability to measure time, a clock, if you will, uh, with microsecond precision. Even if we do assume common descent, universal common ancestry, uh, one of the evidences of that is building trees like uh, the one you see here. I actually built this tree. That's a separate question from the elegance of design. And, Darwin argued that uh, natural selection is the mechanism of this. Richard Dawkins, uh, attacking Paley's uh, watchmaker argument, uh, he attacked it with a book, The Blind Watchmaker. Uh, So he, uh, I'll discuss a little bit of the pros and cons of the various viewpoints. Total aside, that smirk on his face reminds me of Emperor Palpatine. That's neither here nor there. I'd say the strongest argument against intelligent design is articulated by Darwin. He wrote, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and horribly cruel work of nature. Uh, The devil's chaplain may be referring to an individual named Robert Taylor. Uh, That's just incidental. But in contrast to that, the biophysicists, which is the field that I'm interested in biophysics, are, are arguing that life is more perfect than we imagine. That is, many of the machines found in life 
are uh, operating at the extreme uh, limit of what's possible by physics, and that's astonishing them. Uh, <clears throat> and this does relate a little bit to the distinction between creationism and intelligent design. Tertullian is a uh, early church father. He's a Christian. He articulated the creationist case. William Paley's also a Christian, but he's articulating the intelligent design case. I'm just going to um, cover a little bit the distinction. Uh, creationism assumes intelligent design, but the converse is not true. Colloquially, creationism says the world is intelligently designed and intelligently cursed. So creationism attempts to resolve the paradox of an intelligently designed world and a broken world. Um, some forms of creation devote a lot of time to the question of the Noah's flood and the age of the fossil record. Uh, young earth creationism, creationism has a timeline of events. Uh, intelligent design does not. So going back to Paley's watch, uh, again, it's just focusing on whether an object is designed, uh, kind of the criteria we would use to assess human-made designs. And uh, it's pretty much, I'd say, a faith. Uh, assumption that we can extend this to what we would call God-made designs. Um, I don't have time to c cover this article by Natalie Angier. We might be able to revisit it. Um, Darwin's answer to the problem of design was natural selection. I will point out the fundamental theorem of natural selection, as articulated by um, Ronald Fisher, has been disproven and shown relatively useless. It was never biology's central theorem. There are other problems in natural selection, which we can um, try to address in the remainder of this uh, debate. So if I were to describe science, I'd start with the accepted description or approximation of the laws of nature. This, this is a pretty good description of the major fields of physics uh, on which most of modern technology and our understanding of the universe is built. It's not exhaustive, but it, it, it accounts for a lot. I'd like to point out the, um, if you could see my cursor here, this, uh, this equation of quantum mechanics, it's one formulation of it, and the psi function. The psi function can be described like, say, the equation of all reality. And one way it was described by Douglas Hofstadter, a mathematician, he said, one way to think of the universal wave function of quantum physics is as the mind or brain, if you prefer, of the great novelist in the sky, God. Another quantum physicist who was in my textbook, uh, mentioned in my textbook in statistical mechanics and thermodynamics when I was in grad school, uh, said this, we thus see how quantum theory requires the existence of God. Of course, it does not ascribe to God, defined in this way, any of the specific additional qualities that the various existing religious doctrines ascribe to God. Acceptance of such doctrines is a matter of faith and belief. If elementary systems do not possess quantitatively determinate properties, apparently God determines these properties as we measure them. We also observe the fact, unexplainable but experimentally well-established, that God in his decisions about the outcomes of our experiments shows habits so regular that we can express them in the form of statistical laws of nature. This apparent determinism in macroscopic nature has hidden God and his personal influence on the universe from the eyes of many outstanding scientists. A professor at my alma mater, Johns Hopkins University, physicist, he also echoed Belenfanti's views uh, that uh, the universe is immaterial, mental, and spiritual. Now, a lot of physicists will totally disagree. Um, with that characterization. I'm just putting on, on the table to point out the idea of God is not necessarily just uh, something we conjured up with our imagination or philosophy. The uh, fundamental of laws of nature, uh, interpretations of it definitely allow it as a possibility. I will argue that this God that was described by the physicist is eternal. Um, this eternal God that they've argued exists, omnipotent, all powerful, has uh, shown his fingerprints in uh, both the fine tuning of the universe and also in the machines of biology. And that's my opening, and I'll hand it off to RJ. You got it. Thank you very much, Sal, for that opening statement. Want to let you know, folks, if you haven't heard, we have some juicy upcoming debates that you don't want to miss. As an example, I've already mentioned, as you see at the bottom right of your screen, Dr. Kenny Rhodes and 
Matt Dillahunty will be debating whether or not there is good evidence for God, but we are also excited that next month, Apostate Prophet will be debating Christian Dr. Michael Brown on whether or not God exists as well. So, folks, hit that subscribe button. You don't want to miss these upcoming debates because they're going to be epic, and we're pumped for it. With that, we're going to kick it over to RJ. Thanks for being with us, and the floor is all yours for your opening. Yeah, and hopefully my connection, I switched, uh, the the laptop was having problems, so I'm on the PC, and hopefully that will function tolerably well for the whole thing here. Um, the topic I had originally wanted for the debate isn't the one that we have, which uh, is uh, the evidence for intelligent design. I wanted to have a discussion of the uh, intelligent design model, and do they have one, and if they don't, why don't they have one? And Sal did not want to have that as the debate topic, but I still need to address that. Um, the presentation that uh, Sal has done so far is classic intelligent design that kind of dangles God off in the corner somewhere, but argues that there are intrinsic features that lead to inevitably um, the foot in the door for the design. The problem is it's never gotten past that. I'm old enough to remember back in Michael Denton's time in the 1980s when the first little ripples and William Thaxton of the intelligent design movement were starting to come on the scene, and uh, they're all still around now. We have a long track record of absolutely nothing from the intelligent design movement. We've got, uh, starting off with Michael Denton in 1985, as of his latest books, uh, he still hasn't figured out what he thinks happens on anything. He has, a, not Darwinism, not natural selection, not this, not that, but not what he thinks happens in any case whatsoever. It hasn't got to that point. I've interacted with him personally, uh, trying to get him to pin down on the reptile mammal transition, which he functionally accepted. Uh, not uh, Michael Behe, who has now a bunch of books down the road where it's kind of moving the goalposts over to yet new examples. Um, we still don't know what he thinks happens on anything. When were flagellum designed? How many flagella were designed? In what taxa? Is anything naturally related to anything else? Any of that systematic issue? No. And uh, Behe has been roundly criticized again and again and again for deck stacking his arguments, for uh, suppressing information, uh, bypassing uh, stuff that he doesn't want to think about. Uh, that's both in the Imipenum case that he brought up in the Dover trial in 2005, and also in the um, uh, a chloroquine case he went into in the Edge of Evolution, uh, which I wrote a whole big section on in Evolution Slam Dunk, uh, looking into the, the limitations of what he was doing there in regards to Thornton's work. Um, so uh, Behe, uh, only one example that was in his presentation today, Sal's, uh, was one of the examples that Behe brought up, which is the flagellum, which, by the way, wasn't even his idea. It was Michael Denton's uh, from the 1980s. And there was a whole back and forth that goes on on the intelligent design literature on that. But other areas, like the Krebs cycle, uh, Behe never claimed that was intelligently designed. Why? Because we, by that time, knew enough about it that it, even though you could have presented it as such, if you knew l less about the subcomponents, um, he didn't try doing that and never tried to defend that. And so that boundary layer of what exactly is designed and what isn't, where the boundaries are, it, the intelligent design and irreducible complexity mantra gets used widely by people, often bringing up subjects like eyes, which be he never claimed to be an irreducibly complex system in uh, Darwin's black box. So you get this fog bank of uh, debate going on, but still to this day, um, I think uh, Behe was on uh, uh, Dan Stern Cardinale's show. We still don't know what he thinks as to what was designed when map of time clarity of, of a model. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Bill Dembski, uh, the developer of irreducible uh, uh, complexity theory, uh, no free lunch, uh, complex specified information. He's a mathematician. He's got all these little formulas. He's never applied it to genetics. And he's basically walked off the field now and is writing theology books. Here, you would be able to theoretically show in the genomes of actual organisms this supposed complexity and how it works out in a rigorous way at that mathematical formula level that Sal was bringing up regarding uh, quantum theory and physics and all these other examples. The reason why they can come up with high level formulas, and by the way, mathematics is used in, in evolutionary theory all the time, um, biological systems are quite more complicated than physical systems. 
And yet there are even today some physical systems that we don't know the explanations for at a mechanistic level, like lightning in a thundercloud. Nobody is arguing that Zeus is doing that. And yet still there are always levels of things we don't understand. Um, that's the boundary layer of how intelligent design approaches the problem. It's to find a thing where there's a big question mark or even a small question mark and argue that there is the doorway for our design. We don't have to identify the designer. We've established that air quotes, there must be design and please don't bother us with any of the model. That's where we got into with uh, Erica Gutsick Gibbon just a week or so ago when she had a long discussion debate uh, with uh, Gunter Beckley, who is their one and only paleontologist operating in the intelligent design field, where Erica was explicitly trying to pin him down on his model, the lack of a model. Why, what, what do you think happens? Beckley accepts common descent, common ancestry. He thinks that the fossil record is okay for that. He's okay with the reptile mammal transition. And yet he argues that bi uh, biogeography supposedly is a problem for common descent. Well, where exactly are you coming down? Is anything related to anything? What exactly is design? What isn't? What are design events? What would they look like? Beckley understands that there is a problem here that he doesn't want to wade into, and Sal may or may not want to wade into, which is if you create a boundary layer of design, doesn't that apply everywhere where that boundary layer is? And if you're looking at, for example, a molecular interactions, that this is a, a, a lock and key and it must have been designed, well, aren't all lock and keys in biology like that, including the ones that cause diseases, including the ones that create messes for things? At that point, you're in a theodicy issue of where God is having a design that's creepy. God has the parasites. God has all the weird stuff. That was what troubled Darwin way back in the 19th century. And a lot of people that they go, yeeg. Uh, that for some, it was much easier not to bother about it. Beckley didn't want to bother about it either. He recognized that there was that slippery slope, which is why he deliberately wanted to avoid uh, a meddling designer who comes in and designs stuff. What does he think happens then? Well, maybe a, a quantum consciousness thing is happening. That doesn't explain anything. It's a way for him to distance himself from the data field. So this is a phenomenon that we have been observing all through the intelligent design field for decades. Uh, Steve Meyer, Jonathan Wells, Ann Gager, um, uh, Douglas Axe, all of them, uh, only a few interact at the technical level. Axe and Gager, most notably, it's, it's notable that Gager is one who's collaborating with uh, Gunter Beckley on the uh, a promised upcoming paper on whale evolution. Oh boy, am I looking forward to seeing that one. And also feathers. That's a big Michael Denton uh, issue that he's been bringing up on feather evolution. And I wanna see them interact and engage at the data floor level. But what remains over 35 years is there is no there there. The reason why the Einstein formulas are there and the Newton formulas are there is because Newton worked out a rigorous testable model that worked really, really well. And eventually they noticed some anomalies in it they couldn't explain the perihelion of Mercury, so maybe there's a, a, a planet closer to the sun, Vulcan, that's bending Mercury's orbit a little bit, and you could predict outer planets. So that's why we figured out where uh, Neptune and Uranus uh, were predicted purely on gravitational theory. And so there was no reason to throw Newton out the window just because the perihelion Mercury was a little wonky until the Einstein guy came along and said, oh, according to my model, which junks standard um, uh, physical notions and comes up with space time and the bending of space time and all of these other things that um, now Newton works fine for small objects and distant from big stars and the like. But when you start getting close like Mercury, now relativity is playing a case. And we can say why precisely the perihelion of Mercury is precessing relativistically, whereas Newton can't explain it. Does that mean we junk all of Newton's data? No. Newton still works. Uh, NASA doesn't use Einstein's formulas to send probes to Jupiter. It's really complicated formulas. It's easier to use Newton because for what they needed to do still applies. So what you do when you have a paradigm shift is you have a model that is rigorous, that makes predictions that you can test, that accounts for all of your opponent's data because the data ain't gonna go away and also accounts for the new data that supposedly can't be accounted for. And so you have a testable model. Intelligent design has never got to that level. And for that matter, the young earth creationism that Sal apparently also believes, but often doesn't discuss in detail, that too theoretically has, as he mentioned, 
a timeline. But other than cartoons, Young Earth creationism has never got any farther than that either. All they've ended up with is just cartoons. We can uh, uh, test this out with Andrew Snelling and the various people at Institute for Creation Research that they can never get to the level of detail that you find in the actual geology papers and the, and the cosmology papers. So even though there's a cartoon in principle for young earth creationism, it never gets to the model stage. And likewise, intelligent design being creationism light can't even get to that level. No intelligent designer can figure out how many flagella were designed in what circumstances, in what time? Bill Dembski uh, was challenged by Ken Miller uh, back in a debate at Natural History uh, Museum, I think in 2004, somewhere around there, and pleaded with him to tell him when this took place. And whoop, no, it's a fog bank. And yet design events must have taken place in time and space. There must have been a moment when there were no flagella, and at some point by some process, there must come to be flagella all at once, separately, multiple designs, independently in different organisms or common ancestry from a commonly designed unit. What do you think happened? When and if intelligent design ever gets to that stage, then they can work their way up to challenging the paradigm. I'll have to repeat because we're about 11 minutes, I'm almost out of time there. Absolutely nothing we say in this debate is changing any of the facts. Nobody in the scientific community is bothering about what I say in defense of evolution or what Sal says in criticism of, um, or defense of intelligent design or criticism of Darwinism. It's pure schlocky entertainment. Bear that in mind for what we're gonna be talking about in the next times. And I believe I'm just about at 12 minutes and we will say bye-bye. And Thank on to the much. next phase. You got it. And want to let you know, folks, this is part of a 12-hour stream. We are pumped as it has been epic so far, and it's going to become even. It's just the entire day. Phenomenal, you guys. Tom Jump and Nathan Thompson are debating the shape of the Earth tonight. That's been a long-awaited debate. <laughs> oh, you don't dear. want to miss it. And that is showing at the bottom right of your screen. With that, we're going to jump And we warn into people, if they are using this as a drink moment, do not become drunken stupor from the various things you encounter along the way. This is not good for your health. <laughs> not for 12 hours. <laughs> Juicy. And we will kick it into open conversation. Thank you much. Thank you so much, RJ and Sal. The floor is all yours. Thank you, RJ. Uh, you're one of the most formidable opponents I've ever faced. Very sharp and fast mind. And annoying, um, as I well know. <laughs> we uh, agreed to, to have kind of like, I'll be the interrogator for 10 minutes and we'll switch. We won't be anal about time. I do want to contest a few things. Um, the scientific community, if you say they don't pay attention, uh, I've received words from editors that some of my papers are being accepted. They are relevant to this topic. So um, just to correct oh, I, that. Oh, I don't disagree with that. That, that <clears throat> Theoretically, some of these things, a journal of theoretical biology, uh, various but, intelligent design material stuff from Sanford gets published in there. Okay. I'm so, just saying that so far, they've had no impact whatsoever on what actual the scientific community is doing in research lines or, or citations as saying, yeah, we agree with that. And then so I, I, I do want to thank James because I said I wasn't going to argue the model. And he's correct that I'm not arguing for a model or mechanism in the sense that it's repeatable, testable, and controllable. And the irony is uh, um, we're talking about coherent and workable models. Evolutionary theory does not have workable models as some of the examples that I'll be citing. And then also abiogenesis. I'll also point out <clears throat> it should be consistent with physics and chemistry. The arguments I'm putting forward today are not arguments of ignorance. They are arguments by contradiction. And there's a subtle there's an important distinction uh, between an argument of contradiction and an argument of ignorance. Uh, it's an argument by contradiction to say a tornado passing through, through a junkyard is not gonna assemble a 747. That's not an argument for ignorance. The, um, and if the anybody in the biogenesis was claiming that, then you would have a point. That's a straw man. Uh, it's, it's not because we have experimental and physical evidence that there are disorganizing principles active in biology. So if you'll permit me my 10 minutes, um, I'm going to ask you questions. Yeah. On origins or bust, as I was anticipating. Yeah. Thank you. So <clears throat> this is from my slideshow. 
this is an illustration of quarters and um uh, i'm so glad if you're we, going if to we that had one. if we had if we had a random <clears throat> if we had a tray and we threw these these are fair coins presumably and this uh, this is just an illustration if we threw it on the on the tray we would get um what we call a random pattern like this now it is astronomically improbable that we could ever repeat this pattern so in a sense yes it's random and it's astronomically improbable because we're not able to repeat it. We wouldn't expect it to be repeated. However, if we looked at a <clears throat> something a little bit more like this, we'd begin to doubt that a randomizing process is the source. And then even more so with this. So this is also this is also astronomically improbable because we can't repeat it with a random process, but it is also improbable as a matter of principle. If we borrow language from statistics and statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, we would say this, this is improbable as a matter of principle because it is a in a low multiplicity state. You can take the binomial distribution and at the tails of the distribution, uh, the head, all heads is at the extreme tails. Whereas 50% tails and 50% heads is kind of in the middle of the distribution. <clears throat> Why am I bringing this? Uh, would you agree with that? So that's my question. Oh yeah. First. Now, now let me let me put in a question of my own, please. Uh, this delineate. is uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, oh. This is my ten minutes. If we could. Oh okay okay. okay. I'll wait to drop the end right. after you're yeah, done. Then then you can then you can chew me out in your ten minutes. That's fine. Thanks, James. So, so do you agree that this is improbable as a matter of principle? It should stand out. Um. Do you have a problem with that, James? Oh, I'm, oh! Uh, please present your presentation. Don't ask for reactions from me because a yes or no deck stacking is not appropriate. Just present your okay. Argument. Agreed. We'll, we'll do it that way. So, this is improbable as a matter of principle. The thing is, is we see, and then you know, we could also say the same of these these cards if we took uh, the cards and just uh, threw them randomly. We couldn't repeat it. We could say it's astronomically improbable that particular set, but we wouldn't be astonished. We wouldn't make a design argument from that. However, we would make a design argument from a configuration like this or a configuration like this. Uh, the configuration is improbable, not only in the sense that the pattern, not only in the sense that the pattern is not repeatable by random process, but as a matter of principle. It's astonishing because it violates natural expectations of what would happen from random events, uh, moving cards in random orientations, random speeds, random positions. And again, this is like the proverbial tornado passing through a junkyard. It's not gonna assemble something like this. Um, it might make something like that. And so this, uh, again, I said that a term we could use is, this is in a state of low multiplicity at the tails of the distribution. We find this same pattern in biology um, in fact, the Gibbs free energy profile, and um, that involves a little bit of thermodynamics, uh, it would resist the formation of this in a uh, random prebiotic soup. The Uri Miller experiment could not make um, homochiral amino acids like this. James Tour had, uh, who's a very fine chemist, he spoke before the United States Congress on another matter, but that's just all to say he's a top chemist. He said this problem has not been adequately solved. Um, there may be some things that sort of suggest it for amino acids, but it's really bad for uh, sugars and uh, nucleotides. So we have this pattern uh, that we have experimentally established is not uh, is resisted uh, by what we know about chemistry and physics. So at least for now, unless barring a future discovery, this is an argument by contradiction. It is not an argument by ignorance. We know that this shouldn't happen. And then also what we call the three prime to five prime connection in DNA, and I'll cover that a little bit. This is also a violation of the law of large numbers. So I've shown the reason I started out with the coins is just trying to establish the violations of law of large numbers here. It would be evidence for design. Um, in this case, if we happened upon a uh, something like this uh, in a room, we would assume it was intelligently designed. That's partly helped by the fact we know human designers can do this. Um, so the outstanding question is, since um, God doesn't appear to most of us, uh, whether we could extrapolate the same kind of statistics and make that inference, but still it stands. We know experimentally that this is very unnatural. We cannot duplicate it 
especially for the sugars, especially for the sugars, maybe a little bit for the amino acids, but it really fails for the sugars. Uh, it's something uh, that's created by spontaneous. Um, the, the reason it deviates from that is what we call spontaneous isomerization. And we can go into that. Uh, for those interested to get really nerded out, I do talk about this on my channel. At length on the chemistry, we have PhD chemists who talk about this. But back to the three prime, five prime connection here. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but you have like this little carbon here called three prime, and it's connected uh, to a phosphate group uh, to the five prime. The, the five prime is actually up here. To get this to consistently connect, we have to have very special machines if we're synthesizing this from scratch. We need intelligent designers to be able to assemble a DNA when we're doing genetic engineering. And I work for genetic engineers, one of them, the most famous ones. And um, this is not easy to do. It's, it is literally, or perhaps say figuratively similar to arranging coins to be all heads, but this has to be done at the molecular level. So it's not just the connections, we would call this uh, consistent linkage. And uh, Change Tan is a molecular biologist who was encouraged to be a molecular biologist by um, a Nobel Prize winner, George Smith. She's a creationist and ID proponent. She was the one who pointed this out. It's one of the most difficult problems to solve for origin of life. And again, this is not argument by, con by Ignorance, this is argument by contradiction that this does not naturally arise. It's not that we're saying we don't know how it could. It's not expected to. Neither are the ribose sugars here. This is the, uh, the uh, beta D2 uh, deoxyribose furanose form. This is extremely hard to synthesize and make into a nucleotide. So there are many violations of the law of large numbers. This is evidence of design. I pointed out the laws of physics can be interpreted to suggest the existence of God. The kind of what you see here with the DNA exceeds, exceeds a lot of the things in DNA exceed our technology um, is better than all the minds put together on planet earth to be able to build some of the things we see in DNA. And to me, that is prima facie evidence of intelligent design. And James, uh, RJ, thank you for your patience. And, uh, off to you. Okay, uh, that was about eight minutes. That's um, um, reset my little clock here. There we go. Um, I am glad you brought up the coin analogy. There we go. Uh, because there's significant differences between that kind of coin analogy and the biochemistry that the origin of life researchers are doing. And, and I definitely encourage you on the work that you are talking about in the last slide. Uh, we're looking forward to that monograph. We're looking forward to uh, the publication of that. We're looking forward to see what pushback it gets from other researchers. Uh, get in there and, and deal with that. That will be absolutely delightful. The problem with the coin analogy is the same problem that Bill Dembski would have when he would bring up Scrabble tiles. It's divorced from the connection to actual biology. Every one of the coins that would be being generated in a prebiotic context aren't static objects not doing anything. They're biological molecules that connect, or bi molecules in general, that are interacting in varying ways, and there we get into complexity to where a molecule of a particular form in a wet dry cycle is favored as opposed to other molecules that weed out precisely because they don't have those dynamics. And so a lot of the research has been going into the dynamics of how these things are actually behaving in actual prebiotic context. The wet dry cycle issue is one that is uh, showing up. Uh, uh, Jason Hines done stuff on the origin of single chirality of amino acids and sugars. Uh, uh, and uh, then there was some, um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to find that other little paper in there. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, I'm trying to plow around through my notes. Anyway, um, that, that again is an origin of life issue. And so I'd like to ask you, when do you think there was the origin of these DNA systems? Was it a single event involving a single precursor organism or multiple ones? And what do you think happened? Let's get, get uh, I, I want you to think about what you think happened. Please tell us all. Uh, did you want me to respond? 
Yeah, uh, that's called a question. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I have my opinions. Uh, people know that since I'm a young earth creationist, I would say that's 6,500 years, but I'm not um, in a position to defend that. I've actually criticized some of the young earth models. So some of that's taken on faith. So that's beyond, I mean, that's my opinion, but that's, I'd like to point out that's not relevant to the argument that I'm no, making No, but that, that, that's your model, yeah. that there were yeah. individual uh, biblical kinds that <clears throat> yes. were created at a six-day frame, would that be correct, at a single creation week and never before or since, correct? Yes, and, and I don't believe that, um, I know some of my colleagues in the Young Earth Creation community will take exception to the fact that I say that I don't think the model is completely defensive. It's not defensible at this time. It's not ready for prime time. What I did lay out um, in my arguments you think against the abiogenesis, do you think I think a, a four and a half, a four billion year old independent creation of multiple organisms that are bacteria only from which organisms uh, developed afterwards by natural means, is that a defensible one based on the intelligent design literature? Uh, can you repeat the question? That uh, there, would be, there would be multiple bacteria designed by one or more designers four billion years ago from which extant organisms have developed independently by natural means. Is that defendable from a design perspective from what the material you presented so far? For the bacteria only, not the eukaryotic organisms. Oh, why, why do you draw the line there? Uh, eukaryotes have uh, things like membrane bound organelles and um, all sorts of transport. Um, so you are arguing uh, that intelligent design absolutely rules out an endosymbiotic, or any endosymbiotic origin for um, eukaryotes. It, it may, it, it has a flimsy, um, it has a flimsy explanation for the mitochondria. It does not explain the nuclear flimsy? membrane. Define, nor, define flimsy so, for me. I'm sorry? Define flimsy. What do you mean flimsy argument? Well, 85% of the, the, the genes inside the um, that are mitochondrial, uh, that form the mitochondria are from the nuclear. And the alpha protobacteria that supposedly formed it does would only contribute at best 15%. And uh, you had have some very, documentation on that. I do hope we get, I, I'd love to know about that. Uh, yes, uh, molecular, we don't have to present uh, it right here. Yes, I'm happy make, to make pr sure provide that. that. You, that you can uh, happy, show in fact, what, what uh, your documents are. Uh, uh, Penny's, um, The Irreducible Nature of Eukaryotes, published with two other researchers, actually covered that. That's where I got the statistics. So if you look up the, t the title of the peer-reviewed paper, Irreducible Nature of Eukaryotes, and I love that title, Irreducible, uh, he will cite those statistics and the problems of the, um, the alpha protobacteria being um, an origin for that. It certainly oh, that does was, not explain. Oh, you mean, uh, okay, uh, that's uh, Curlin, Collins, and Penny, 2006. Uh, what's yes. their view currently? That's 15 years ago. Have any of them changed their views? I don't know, because Kunin has come in and said the problem with eukaryotic evolution is a mystery. It's getting worse. The problem's not getting better. To be just saying uh, that, that, yeah, the, to be just yeah, saying the authority that it's 2000. On that. I'm so sorry? You, so, so you have not checked to find out whether Curlin, Collins, or Penny's view in 2015, uh, 2021 um, it has altered from what they were writing in that 2006 piece. That is correct, because because the data is now making the, the case worse. In fact, I've checked more recent literature, so it's not relevant whether Curlin so or so others. Their it's, it's relevant so whether their opinions, it's one sec, just I'm, to hear the my, rest my of the actual response here. from Sal. I think sometimes Thank that you. question is asked to Sal and he, he answers part way and then he gets cut off with another question. Mm. Well, thanks, uh, then, thanks, guys. Then, then, I was then, saying so, I have I have read on my channel current literature on eukaryotic evolution, and it is problematic. Uh, I, I I had two articles on my channel. It was just a journal club reading, so it's um, it's not really you know the so insinuation is I'm not Curlin, kept up with the literature I why have. Why did you bring up Curl in 2006 if it doesn't matter whether their views have changed because you have different data that doesn't depend on Curlin for your argument? I was citing where the statistics where you asked me for a reference for the statistics of the 15%. That's where I happen to know it off the top of my okay. head. But okay. if you'd like, we can actually do a literature literal, literature search to see if that number still holds. But yeah, yeah we, we, we want to do that in, in the side thing. So um, uh, so you then would draw that there's a now 
uh, intelligent design argument, which is not young earth creationists, would have a separate design event taking place regarding the eukaryotes. Would that be the intelligent design model? I don't believe they're intelligent design models. Ever? They're models, they're models that there's not one uniform model. But, there but, might but be individual. Let us hypothesize <clears throat> an intelligent design hypothesis here. Is it a legitimate intelligent design hypothesis to have a design event for the origin of life involving multiple bacteria, a later design event billions of years later for eukaryotes independent from that and possibly done by a completely different designer? Is that a legitimate intelligent design hypothesis based on the available data today? One could put it put forward like that. Stephen Meyer has one that is similar to that. It's not well developed and that would be more an off the cuff type speculation. It's not something of deep interest to most ID proponents. So if you're and complaining, we don't have space. And why isn't it? Can you speculate as to why it isn't a, a deep interest of intelligent design proponents? It's beyond the reach of us to, to figure all this out. Even though you've got a time frame for eukaryotes, you're not arguing there's any um, uh, evidence that eukaryotes date back to uh, say, uh, um, four billion years, do you? I, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't see, I'm, I don't see your, what your line of questioning is, I'm where it's going, I'm just saying, I, I just stated what's going why, on in your map of time. And I'm suspecting that we, very we little have, is going on. There's a lot of times where of time. the question is asked to uh, Sal, and then he doesn't have a, it's not clear as a oh, full well. chance to respond. As long as you're not filibustering Sal, which I, I don't think you are, we'll, we'll want to be sure you get a chance to respond. Yeah, let, let, let's give Sal a couple minutes to say <clears throat> what he thinks is the range of intelligent design argument that would be available in the repertoire that would be consistent with the data that would relate to the origin of eukaryotes. I believe it has to be rather instantaneous. It's irrelevant whether it's billions of years ago or not, because the uh, the transition would require multiple simultaneous changes. And I'm going to show videos on that in my 10 minute segment, why it would have to be. And you'd only get maybe one shot at it. And oh, that's good. why it'd have yeah. to be intelligent. So we're in perfect um, time because I'm about at about 10 well, minutes. That's, that's uh, only so, 18 seconds into the two minutes. So it just, do you have more? So let, let's give, let's give Sal um, his 10 minute next uh, and present the material on the eukaryotes. Let's dive into that. Sure. But I do want to give him a chance to actually, I don't think he was done finishing answering that question. So oh. I do want to give him that time as well. Yeah. I will have a chance to, um, I'm going to, I think maybe uh, I'll go ahead and, and talk about the difficulty of the eukaryotic transition. And that might answer RJ's question. So this is at 1807. So I'll talk about this transition. It would also show why if we assume the case for universal common ancestry, we would have to uh, invoke miracles that are uh, indistinguishable from special creation. So here is the uh, difference between the eukaryote and prokaryote architecture. Probably one of the most important features is that the eukaryotes have membrane bound organelles and I'll highlight especially one of them, the nucleus here. So this stringy thing here in, in the prokaryote is the DNA. The DNA is also in the eukaryote, but to access, for chemicals to access it, um, it has to go through this nuclear pore, through this nuclear membrane, and the membrane has little gateways that we call the nuclear pore complex. So again, this is the eukaryotic nucleus. And the difficulty is that um, proteins have to go in and out through these pore complexes. So if we just create a membrane without the complexes, the creature's dead because uh, there's no way to access the DNA and, 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 and all the proteins, instant death. Natural selection would not be a good explanation for this. Neither would random mutation, obviously. Um, I'm gonna show a little bit of the complexity of the nuclear pore complex here. This is silent, by the way. We can all hum music. 456 proteins of 30 different types, um, membrane spanning proteins, which creates another problem. So even if we assume just a few, even a few proteins might be too difficult 
in terms of random chance. So uh, James is asking me why I think this uh, would require intelligent design. I'm trying to show depict visually why this is. Mm -hmm. And for things to uh, go in and out of the nuclear pore complex here, this, um, it has to identify what is supposed to go in and out because not anything can go in and out and, and the system would be functional. So I'm gonna skip a little bit here. I hope that one made the point. Now I'm gonna show how things go in and out of the nuclear pore complex. This is <clears throat> this would have to be in place for the eukaryote to exist. This is why I don't, if we accept universal common ancestry, you'd need miracles to make it happen. Consider all the parts that are needed to facilitate this. This is a four minute video. The nuclear pore complexes are the only channels through which small polar molecules, ions, and macromolecules can travel between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. By controlling this traffic, the nuclear pore complex plays a fundamental role in the physiology of all eukaryotic cells. Most proteins and RNAs are too large to move through the complex by passive diffusion and must move by an active process in which appropriate proteins and RNAs are recognized and selectively transported in a specific direction. Let's consider proteins imported from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. Only a subset of proteins can enter the nucleus and they are allowed in by virtue of having specific amino acid sequences called nuclear localization signals. Nuclear localization signals typically consist of one or two short segments of basic amino acids. Nuclear localization signals are recognized by nuclear transport receptors called importins, which carry the cargo proteins into the nucleus. With its cargo attached, importin binds to specific nuclear pore proteins in the cytoplasmic filaments. By sequential binding to more interior nuclear pore proteins, the complex is translocated through the nuclear pore. At the nuclear side of the pore, the complex is disrupted by the binding of a protein called RAN to importin. RAN carries a molecule of GTP. This binding changes the conformation of importin which then releases its cargo protein into the nucleus. The important RAN complex is then re-exported through the nuclear pore. A protein in the cytoplasm called RAN gap for GTPase activating protein stimulates RAN to hydrolyze its GTP to GDP, an action that triggers RAN to release important back into the cytoplasm. RAN plays a key role in protein import and export. Note that while RAN is bound to GDP, it cannot disrupt the binding of important to a cargo protein. <clears throat> In an action that prevents the depletion of RAN from the nucleus, the RAN GDP formed in the cytoplasm is transported back to the nucleus by its own import receptor, a protein called NTF2. In the nucleus, another protein called ran GEF for guanine nucleotide exchange factor, stimulates RAN GDP to release its GDP and pick up GTP. In this form, RAN GTP can disrupt the binding of importin and its cargo, triggering the release of the cargo in the nucleus. By the actions of RAN GEF, found only in the nucleus, and RAN GAP, found only in the cytoplasm, a steep gradient of RAN GTP and RAN GDP is maintained across the nuclear membrane, with RAN GTP inside the nucleus and RAN GDP in the cytoplasm. Similar to imported proteins, proteins are targeted for export from the nucleus by specific amino acid sequences called nuclear export signals. Nuclear export signals are recognized by receptors within the nucleus called exportins, which direct protein transport through the nuclear pore complex to the cytoplasm. RAN GTP promotes the formation of stable complexes between exportins and their cargo proteins. Note that this same form of RAN does the opposite for importins and their cargos. The effect of RAN GTP binding on exportins dictates the movement of proteins containing nuclear export signals from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. 
Following transport to the cytosolic side of the nuclear envelope, GTP hydrolysis and release of RAN-GDP leads to dissociation of the cargo protein, which is released into the cytoplasm. Exportins are then recycled through the nuclear pore complex for reuse. So I have a few more minutes. I'd like to cover a little bit more in my time. So that was my answer why I think that needs, that's a partial answer. That also addresses the problem of the nuclear, the nuclear genes uh, that have to be coded and then made to proteins and then have to enter the mitochondria. That's why the endosymbiosis problem uh, hypothesis has these challenges. It's not gonna go through just one nuclear complex. It's gonna go through other complexes of transmembrane proteins. This is, this is a disaster for the endosymbiotic theory. And um, what I'll usually get from evolutionists is they'll say, oh, well, we have these phylogenetic reconstructions that show that it evolved. And um, I'm gonna criticize that, but you, you see, just being able to build trees of similarity does not explain how this complexity could evolve simultaneously or how it's worked around. And so that's why I believe that uh, there had to be an intelligent design event if there's if there's universal common ancestry, if we accept it, even with the mainstream timelines, that's going to be problematic. So um, I'm glad you brought that up, why you wanted to argue eukaryotic evolution. And this is only a fraction of the problems. And so, you know, evolutionists can hand wave this away, uh, which they usually do, and they just do these phylogenetic reconstructions in trees. And that's these are non sequiturs that they're actually posing to me from an engineering standpoint and the problems of statistics. It just doesn't agree. It's violations of natural expectations. And I showed a little illustration of that in abiogenesis as far as the chemicals. And by the way, what happens with the chemicals, uh, you're saying that the coins don't reflect it adequately. Um, that's correct in that it's the problem's worse at the chemical level. So I'll hand it off to you, James, and uh, thank you for, for bearing okay, everyone. Yeah, let, let's explore more of that, um, of that um, eukaryote thing. So um, there are lots and lots and lots of eukaryotes, um, tiny microscopic ones and us and insects and plants and all of these other things uh, in there. So the poor mechanism that you assert on intelligent design grounds is irreducibly complex and designed instantaneously. This was an instantaneous design for each organism that was done or what? What do you think happened? I, I, I would, that's my opinion. Um, that's different than whether I can make that claim defensible and I'm not in a position to do that today. Uh, but I appreciate the question. I mean, you know, it's good you ask me. I'm not objecting. I'm just saying. Yeah, so I, what would be the range of thinking on this in the intelligent design community from a Steve Meyer to a Jonathan Wells to a, a Dembski and others uh, on origin of eukaryotes? How many origin events were there? Uh, how spaced out in time are they? Because we're a long way away from the first eukaryotes. I, I don't think they've explored it. I don't think they, I haven't seen any literature to it. We don't talk I'll about it. I'll agree with you. Neither have I. Okay. <laughs> they haven't thought about this. That's part of the no model uh, issue. Um, so um, who, who are some of the major researchers in that, that you brought up the video there uh, on the, um, the RAN GTP and uh, GDP export and import, and who have been some of the major uh, researchers in that area? I'm not familiar with the names. The, this is basically textbook cell biology. Did so, you do any um, investigation on, on whether or not the various components uh, have uh, had literature uh, working out evolutionary aspects of how those are developed? I looked at it a little bit and I get, uh, so short answer no, because if you'll allow me to explain why, I see the Go same ahead. garbage recycled all the time. And I just get tired of wasting my time on it because what they'll do is just make a phylogenetic tree, which I pointed out is not an explanation of mechanism. So, so you if you are asserting, you are right to say that I maybe didn't look at it because I get tired of seeing the recycled garbage that they represent a scientific explanations that's no more than storytelling without any st study of statistics or physics and chemistry, the probability of this emerging, neither do they look at whether even selective 
action is a good explanation. So, so you are asserting that the various papers that have thought about the evolution of the various components of that poor system are drawing on only phylogenetic trees for their inferences and offering no biological details other than that. Just garbage. Mostly. Mostly, mostly garbage. And, and mostly can, garbage. Can, okay. Uh, in, for the reader's and, benefit, we can go through these papers, and I, I that's a testable prediction. It's going to be yeah, the same exactly. Exactly. I'm writing it down. Yes. So um, we can do that on my channel or somewhere. We, we'll go through the papers, and we'll see it's going to be a phylogenetic reconstruction, which is tree drawing, mm -hmm. which is not much more than um, first grade just drawing up trees. I mean, really, or, it's not. Or it's not a scientific might I submit to you? that they would be using phylogenetic trees as guideposts because you need to have a sense about what is happening in what order to give a better clue as to what might be going on as the system develops and alters from one to another. Are you, uh, here's another empirical question I'd like to have nailed down. Are you contending that the poor system in eukaryotes is absolutely a universal and that there's absolutely no variation from one organism to another on it? No, I'm not. Do you, can you characterize what range of variation there are in, among eukaryotes on this system? No. Have you thought to look as to what range of variation there is among eukaryotes on this? I've thought to look at it, but uh, considering how many eukaryotic systems there are, that would be intractable. Okay, I can tell you that is an issue I have not investigated, and therefore I'll be coming into it cold to see what exactly is has been done or not on this matter. And anybody watching the show then can mark this down. Okay, testable hypothesis that we can work through. Uh, I think we've done this one out to death. Uh, um, I think uh, uh, it'd be nice to get um, <coughs> Sal's next heavy gun that he wants to bring up uh, as what he would consider a, a really solid in instance of intelligent design. And then I'll be wanting to find out more about how that fits in at all in the intelligent design framework. Okay, thank you. It is 1821. I will show an example of where phylogenetic trees fail. Uh, it will be with the topoisomerase enzyme, which I've recently published Ooh, yeah, on. I expected you to bring that one up. <laughs> That's your latest thing. By the uh, way, when, when can we expect some technical work? I think you've, you've been working with Sanford or who on this? Uh, I, there, was a, there was an article May 14th on uh, my work in structural biology, bioinformatics, published. It was an announcement in the FACIB journal. If you go to my channel, you actually see my announcement of it. It was a team of researchers, including computer scientists, protein biologists. And what was the uh, abstract concept? What was the issue that was being presented in that paper? Uh, is this my time or yours? Because then I'm going to reset the, the clock to 6, 1822. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Can, I, will, oh, yeah. I will remain silent. That's, that's cool. I, I, uh, I appreciate I'm a curious guy, Sal. I, I like to know things. You are. I appreciate. I appreciate your interest, uh, James. So I, I take no offense that you asked me that. So if uh, we'll, we'll just, uh, 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 if you'll indulge me, I will show what the topoisomerase enzyme does. So first, I'll show the uh, the sequence. This uh, uh, listing here, if you see the alphabetic letters, this is a um, this is a listing of the amino acids represented by English alphabetic letters for the topoisomerase, and it's relatively small, about 1,500 amino acids, 1,500 residues or so. And I'm going to show what it does. Uh, oh, I know now. I'm criticizing phylogenetic reconstructions. So this is the human topoisomerase. And then there's the bacterial homolog of that, which is called gyrase. And I actually built this diagram from all the sequences. I used a uh, evolutionary program to build this tree. And I'm showing that I'm going to try to argue why this is not, this is not a mechanistic explanation for the evolution of the topoisomerase going from a prokaryote to eukaryote. And I'm gonna specifically highlight the problems. But first, let's learn a two minute video on the topoisomerase. Let's consider what happens as DNA unwinds during replication. As DNA unwinds, it acts like this rope when we pull apart its two strands. 
As you pull the strands apart, twisting tension builds up in the rest of the coiled portion. It is actually adding one twist to the remaining rope for each twist pulled out of it. At some point, you can't separate the strands anymore. The remaining rope is too tightly twisted. If you relax your tension on the rope, it will twist around itself in a supercoil. It is releasing tension. If you want to keep pulling the rope apart, you have to release the tension periodically. And one way to do this is to cut the rope and splice it back together. This problem has been best characterized in small circular DNAs. There are two methods of dealing with this problem in DNA. One cuts only one strand of the DNA double helix, and the other cuts both strands. Let's look at the first. Topoisomerase 1 enzymes cut a single strand of the double helix, pass the other strand through the cut, and reseal the break, relaxing the overwound molecule, which now has one fewer twist. Topoisomerase 2 enzymes do the same thing, but with both strands of the double helix. Topoisomerase 2 cuts both strands of a double-stranded DNA and passes another double strand through the break and then reseals the break. So if a molecule of DNA is supercoiled, topoisomerase 2 can remove the supercoiling, two twists at a time, to yield a relaxed circle. So that was the topoisomerase, that's its action. I'll point out why this is problematic for natural selection just for the top isomerase, then I'll point out why this is difficult to evolve going from a prokaryote to eukaryote if we assume that we have the top isomerase inherited by common ancestry from the prokaryote, the bacteria, to the new eukaryote. I'm going to highlight the reasons why. But first off, the top isomerase in itself, uh, it's hard to evolve by natural selection. Uh, it cuts. Let's say you have a top isomerase uh, ancestor. All it can do is cut. It doesn't ligate. That, or is, that is to say, it doesn't reconnect the DNA pieces together. It's going to shred the genome. So the idea of an incremental evolution of this, uh, at least in those terms, is outrageous. It's ridiculous. This is a proof by contradiction, not an argument from ignorance. It's not going to happen. By the way, topoisomerase is a target, disrupting it uh, in chemotherapies. Uh, we can kill cells by disrupting topoisomerase. This is life critical. So, um, and then also if you have something that uh, doesn't cut, but it ligates, that's pretty useless. Or if it cuts and ligates, but doesn't untangle, it's useless. So the idea of incremental evolution of this from either abiogenesis or some protocell, this is going to be very problematic. Uh, so neither random mutation or natural selection is an adequate explanation. But more to the point, what happens if we're trying to inherit uh, a topoisomerase that is in a bacteria to a eukaryote? The major problem and the reason I'm glad I, I showed the, um, the nuclear pore import export, and if you'll remember in that video, some of you will remember it, uh, the uh, narrator mentioned the nuclear localization signal. You can find uh, the nuclear, by the way, since uh, RJ loves references and mm -hmm. um, I have five more minutes, you can get this sequence from the Uniprot database. Just type in top two, top two A. You'll get this sequence. That's the human topoisomerase. Uh, there are other topoisomerases if you're interested in that. The nuclear localization signal was in a article uh, called the Bi bipartite nuclear localization in topoisomerase. You can Google it, you'll find it. And I was able to uh, get the sequence right here. It's highlighted in red. That's the nuclear localization. That's like a password for it to go through the nuclear pore complex. So what's the point of this? The phylogenetic diagrams, I'm sorry. Let's see if I have it. The phylogenetic diagrams will just sort of gloss over that problem. But if it's not there and it whole, just like a password, if it's not spelled correctly, it doesn't work. And there's only one chance you get at this. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, the creature's dead. And so that's something that is, an, that is an example where the phylogenetic reconstruction glosses over a serious problem. And um, let's see if there's anything else on the topi. Uh, that's all I had on the topi somerase as far as nuclear localization. I'll point out that any other inherited 
uh, any other inherited proteins that come from uh, that supposedly got inherited from the bacteria to the eukaryotic form would also have to have nuclear localization signals inserted in them for them to work. And the nuclear localization signal problem also is confronting this whole thing about endosymbiosis. So that the extent that the mitochondria has lots of the 85% of nuclear genes that are part of uh, end up uh, coding the proteins in the mitochondria, they need these localization signals too. And on top of that, there's localization. This is the localization signals at the amino acid level. Um, I haven't even talked about the mRNAs. Um, there are localization signals uh, involved there. It might be a little easier um, because they may be on the uh, poly A tails. But th these are things that you ask, uh, you're criticizing the ID community for not being interested in certain things. It's partly because we're interested in these things, which the evolutionists don't talk about because they don't have no solutions. They only pretend to have them. So cool. I hand it off to you. If you have any questions on this, uh, on the uh, yeah. Um, so that the the Deweese you mentioned, uh, Deweese, that would be Joseph uh, Deweese, the young Earth creationist, right? I want to mention, RJ, I promise I'll give you a chance to respond. The only reason I'm jumping in is just to let people know that we'll probably go over another five to ten minutes, and then we'll be jumping into the Q and A. Oh, goody. Oh, well, actually, um. I'm, uh, rather than beating lay dead horse, uh, I think it'd be perfectly fine to go into Q&A because we did start late uh, and there were bumping in and out and all that stuff. So if it's okay with Sal, let's go with the q and I can't see any of the questions. I, I'm not watching the video, so I don't know what kind of live chat or who's in that. So I'll, we I'll depend just on you, James, to, to act as the font of communication between that window and ours. Is my um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to just finish off the respond to the quick question that RJ asked. Is that Joe DeWeese, the Young Earth Creationist? He's an associate professor of biochemistry at Lipscomb and an adjunct professor at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Oh yeah, and he's public. I've got quite a few of his papers in my in my reference okay. base. He's one of the, the the body of Young Earth Creationists that have published in regular technical literature, often collaboratively with other people. Just so um, I'm fine with uh, going to the Q&A. You got it. And folks, I want to let you know we are thrilled as up next at 8 p.m. Eastern tonight. In other words, in about an hour and a half, this debate is happening. Namely, T Jump and Nathan Thompson are going to debate it out. This will probably, we'll take a break from flat earth debates probably for a while after this one. It's going to be epic though, folks. You don't want to miss it. And so that's going to be right here on this stream as we are doing a 12 hour non stop stream of debates. Debate again. And so first question, thanks so much for yours. Answers in atheism says, I have an after show to do an autopsy on Sal after the debate. Juicy. <laughs> Sal, no response. More comment oh. than a question. Bubblegum Gun, thank you thank, for yours. Thank you for the super chat. Bubblegum Gun says, best masterpiece movie is Hard to Be a God, 1989. I've never heard it. Is this a real movie, RJ? I haven't heard of it either, but th there's a lot of movies I don't know about. And Andrew Roos, thanks for your question, says James. <laughs> just a reminder that you're the man. Thank you, Andrew. You are the man. We appreciate your support, seriously. And my name is Mud. Thank you of for your Of course you're a man. Stickers. You're an endothermic vertebrate, too. Thank you, RJ. I've never heard such a sweet thing in all my life. And John W., thank you for your question, says, Do not think we do not understand Sal is a vet in parentheses, as well as me, while he defended us, we got to learn and focus. Do not attack Sal. Do not denigrate, but educate. That's kind, John. And that's a great opportunity for me to remind you folks, want to encourage you, attack the arguments as maliciously and with as much malevolence as you can. However, we do want to ask that you would not attack the person as we do appreciate them. And you guys, 99.9% .9 of you do a fantastic job. So we appreciate that. Pancake of Destiny says, if we are designed, designer is not intelligent, Sal. There are too many flaws in our bodies that could be fixed by the average dumb Joe. What do you say to that, Sal? The average dumb Joe cannot fix our problems. Otherwise, we would have healed all diseases. Uh, as I said, creationism argues that uh, the world is cursed, and it is by God's design that he makes us know, know that we're not God. So the flaws in our body are reminders, and there are a lot of people that think they know better than God. And so uh, God has left reminders that we are flawed, that we are mortal, 
and we are diseased and we're in need of redemption and a savior to bring us into the next life. So that's part of the intelligent design also. Gotcha. And Although intelligent design movement tries to avoid that. Just as a demographic, I'll point out the vast majority of intelligent designers are relatively conservative Protestants. There are some Jews and Catholics knocking around in there. Uh, and um, you get quasi uh, agnostic free thinkers like uh, Michael Denton uh, pops into that category that are technically non-believers and David Berlinski. But by and large, it is a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge theology thing. And I'll just say that the, the designer, uh, Isaiah would have had no problem with the idea that everything bad and good is all due to God, and that would include all the nasty diseases. But it does make God kind of a sadist because they didn't realize how bad things were. <laughs> I'll give you the last word, Sal, since the question was originally targeting you. Well, we have self-destructive designs like fireworks, and we also even have self-destructive biological designs. Monsanto built these uh, terminator and traitor seeds. So just the fact that something dies or self-destructs is not evidence against intelligent design. So the fact that the terminator traitor seed self-destructing is pretty clever, honestly. Chris Peacock, thanks for your super sticker. Do appreciate your support as well as John W. says, I trust Sal and I know there is something out there. We do not have faith in the same ideas, but he is a brother even if not the same. Glad. Thanks, John, for your, uh, what's the word? Thanks for your kindness. And okay. Pancake of Destiny says, if we are designed, oh, we got that one. And thanks, Heinrich Van Neuhusen. Thank you for your question. Says, the design argument fails. The laryngeal nerve in giraffes, human eating and breathing via the same pathway. The anus being so close to the sexual organ. These are as I think they were trying to argue, these are bad design examples. Sal, go ahead. We'll give you a chance to respond. We don't know that they're bad design examples. I, I talked about the biophysicists that say we're excellently designed. So, uh, but even a feature of bad design, I mean, Rube Goldberg machines could be argued to be bad designs, but they are not created for the benefit of the Rube Goldberg machine. They are meant to impress the viewers of just the ingenuity that something uh, on the verge of just collapsing actually can still work. So, uh, and I dispute some of the claims about the laryngeal nerve. And uh, so um, to take this, just consider the question, is a Rube Goldberg machine designed or not? It's irrelevant whether one would classify it as good or bad. It's the improbability that's the real question. Oh, by the way, thanks to all that have been super chatting. Thank you uh, for the question. I'll just say from an evolutionary point of view, bad design is not quite the term I would use. Contingent design. Uh, the laryngeal nerve is a matter of where back when vertebrates were really early and didn't have long necks to worry about, that one nerve just went one way and another goes to the other, and it's a nice, neat, compact thing in basal uh, chordates. But as the system changed, there's no designer to say, well, maybe I could run it over here just as easily, not a problem. As things get longer and longer and longer, the thing still has to loop around as the this system developed. And there's a lot of, of contingent systems in that. Uh, that uh, Jackson Wheat and I uh, dealt with some of that in uh, uh, The Rocks Were There, uh, Volume 1, book plug. You got it. And thank you very much for your, let's see. Oh, Sal, given that, the, that I don't want to gang up on you. So given that that last question was meant to challenge your position, I'll give you the last word. Um. I'll let RJ have the last word, so I'm done. You got Th it. Thank you for the yeah, question. You, you gave exactly the response that um, condensed down what you would find. You could easily go to the discovery. Oh, wait, all right. Joshua, I was, I was offering Sal another IG. chance to respond, not They'll you, RJ. Okay, already. Joshua, Alec, thank you for your question. It says, Sal, you're, sorry for interrupting, RJ. Just to, just to jump into you got a lot of questions. Come Sal on. says, or uh, Joshua, Alex says, Sal, your coin analogy doesn't hold water because it ignores selective pressures. What is select? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I was referring specifically to abiogenesis. The, the selective pressure is for disorganization. That's demonstrated by the Gibbs free energy. I have a reference from it somewhere uh, from a uh, stereochemistry book. That's also true for the ribosis and all. 
So uh, the selection that the uh, that the individual was posing is fantasized. It's not what's actually seen in chemistry. You got it. And thank you very much for your question. Coming in from John W. Strikes again, says, stop RJ. Is he is acting like a predator and taking over? Let Sal speak. Yeah, well, don't worry. We're good. And Gordon Fiala, thanks for your super sticker, as well as Soldier of Science, who says, Sal, is there a biological process you think isn't complex enough to be designed? Um. I, I think there's some biological processes that don't have to be designed. Thank you for the question. Or I wouldn't bother arguing for it, even if it is. There's there's some. And so um, one? I, I haven't really focused on those. And um, so it's, sorry, I can't give a more substantive answer. It's not anything I've really thought about. So, um, but thank you anyway for uh, donating to the uh, Modern Day Debate channel. Dr. RJ, it looks like it sounded like you had something to add. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I was just marveling at the response. You got it. And soldier of science says, Sal is, got that one, standing for truth. Thanks for being here. It says, keep up the good work, James. One day I'll hopefully be able to rock that suit jacket as well as you do, brother. God bless. Thank you for your kind words, standing for truth. I promise as a result of such a kind message, I will stop calling you standing for poop for at least two weeks. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. But for real, I do appreciate standing for truth. He's been only on a here. fortnight. You're only promising a fortnight. Okay. That's right. And okay, the Batman with a uh, trollish super chat. Let's see. I think we've got more serious questions coming up. So let me just reload yeah. this page and we'll look at those. So want to mention in the meantime thank you very much folks our guests are linked in the description so that way if you want to hear more from them oh well, you certainly can by clicking on those links down below soldier of science with the question says sal your entire argument was an intelligent designer how do you get to a personal god after that though you wouldn't get it through uh thank you soldier of science for the question i believe the personal god has to reach out to each individual and so um, it's really God finding us. I had a vision when I was very young. It's something I can't run away from. There have been certain people that have uh, experienced miracles in their lives, and a lot of them are on my channel. Uh, it does raise the question why God would reach out to some and not others, and I covered that on my channel. I don't think that any answer to that is satisfactory, but I don't think we can go from a um, kind of the designer I described through quantum mechanics and the equations of physics and the arguments of Paley's watch to the personal God. That's something that uh, God has to do for you. Dr. Joshua Alex says, Sal, selective pressures aren't limited to reproduction. A crystal forms in its shape because chemical laws select that arrangement over all others. Um, thank you for the point. Uh, there is selection in uh, crystal formation but there is, you can't really describe what happens in spontaneous isomerization. And uh, and I, I could show these diagrams of like, say, the aldopentoses. You don't end up, even though the chemical formula is, I believe, C5H10O5 um, for the aldopentoses, they're like, uh, there are at least eight major forms. And even within those, there are other more isomers. There's no, you can't characterize that as selection because... One of those forms, uh, the uh, beta two, the beta D two um, uh, deoxyribose or ribose, depending RNA or DNA, uh, furanose form is the one that is selected for the nucleic acids. I mean, that appears in the nucleic acids, but there's no selection pressure for that. There's actually, if we were going to use the word selection, which is really a misnomer, it would be against that, and um, also for the consistent linkage. I'd like to also promote Change Tan and Rob Stadler's book that actually cover that. And um, thank you for the question. And sorry to disagree because we're having so much fun. Gotcha. It, is there any discretion in those chemical bonds? In other words, could any gods decide to make oxygen not bond with stuff just by fiat? Mm, I never thought of that. Sorry, I don't have a good answer, RJ. <laughs> Gotcha. And Good for thought. this next question coming in from Bubblegum Gun says, watch, quote, hard to be God, 1989. Put it on YouTube. 
Gotcha. I'm thinking they're saying like search for it on YouTube. Sounds Movie juicy. plugs. And John W. with another question says, I am 31 and do not play Fortnite and as well, just try and learn. Thank you, John W. We appreciate that. And thank you very yes, much. If anybody can make any sense out of what that meant, let me know. I'm confused by it too. Cosmic Reach says, when it comes to observations, we are working post. The coin analogy makes an appeal to a pre-infinity. How do you fix this, Sal? Are you trying to prescribe what we are describing? Uh, thank you for the question and the comment. The coin analogy um, really, really is to illustrate um, a mathematical abstraction that we, we call the binomial distribution. Um, one doesn't need to uh, appeal to infinity to describe the binomial distribution. And the problem actually works really, the problem it poses actually works well in finite universes. When you only have a finite amount of time to be able to, to uh, mix the coins uh, before they can be all heads. So um, if I misunderstood. Uh, On that very question, particular that, point, Sal and, and I are in agreement. <laughs> okay, you heard it, we're in agreement, so. Yeah. Binomial theorem, it doesn't depend on an infinitely long universe, that it would come up in any context. One of the problems with working out our biogenesis issues is that the only things we have to look at are existing organisms that are a long way removed, and we can't even tell how many lineages have died out along the way, like the ancestor of the mitochondria. Gotcha. And this question coming in from Nick, do appreciate it. Nick asks, if an intelligently designing personal god existed, wouldn't it be obvious to everyone instead of having to rely on God of the gaps arguments? That's a great question, Nick. I addressed the um, question of the hidden God on my channel, and I'm obviously promoting this. This is why I like debates. It's a chance for free advertising. But the question of the hidden God, why would God be so hidden? Why isn't he as evident to our senses as the air we breathe? And that's, that's a very legitimate question. And that I would say that that's one of the main causes for atheism. And my answer to that is, and this is my interpretation, and I believe it's uh, consistent with, with what's taught in the Bible, is that the hidden God, mostly hidden God, it says in Proverbs 25 too, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. The glory of kings to search it out. And Jesus also says that I thank you, Father, heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. The mechanism, the choice of God being hidden to most is a way that he can separate those who really want to pursue him from those that don't. He makes it really easy for those who want to close their eyes. And hence the design argument is one way. It's subtle enough that if people want to close their eyes to it, they won't see it. And that's how, that's one of the mechanisms that he uses to uh, separate those who want to pursue the Christian God versus those who don't. And that's my answer. Um, that's not a scientific answer. Thank you for the question. This one from- Yeah, and of course, uh, all the other religions get to play too. And what evol evolves is that human beings make up the little fiddly bit details to fill in all of the hidden parts, which is most of it. <laughs> Sorry, next one. Tape Deck, I was just watching Sal's face. That's the only reason I'm laughing. Tape Deck says, do Sal or RJ believe an intelligent mind can exist without a brain? I, I believe in a disembodied, the possibility of the disembodied intelligence. Um, that was that was really kind of the suggestion when I showed the laws of physics and then I quoted the physicist. The assumption is uh, whatever that mind is, it's uh, composed uh, differently than um, the minds here. And, um, you know, by way of extension, one could postulate uh, disembodied minds too. There was a physicist, Paul Davies, that talked about this in one of his books. I actually never read it. It would be interesting read. So thank you for the question. Yeah, we're, we're sort of in an other rare instance of agreement. I don't rule out in principle disembodied supernatural entities uh, as well. The question is, is there really good evidence that they interact? And if they are interacting in time space, then now we can potentially delineate whether or not they're doing anything here versus somewhere else. And my general position would be that based on the history of like the God of Abraham tales is that that one is not even a contender because the narratives there don't match up with what we can see in nature. 
And all the other religions have the same problem. Next up, well, thank I you. I have no further comment. <laughs> you got it. This one coming in from JC93013 says, Sal, provide irrefutable, indisputable proof of God. Uh, I can't because I'd have to be God to do that. But thank you for the question. Um, I, I, people assent to God or no God. Um, well, people assent to God be, through faith. It, it's not by direct proof. So It, it uh, is a I gotcha question. And I'll, I'll give you Euler's answer. Uh, he once uh, is alleged, I guess, to have written on the blackboard E to the pi I power plus one equals zero. Boop! therefore God, and dared anybody to disagree with him on it. So there's all sorts of people who want to find routes to God can find them. People who don't, won't. Juicy Bubblegum Gun says, seriously, watch, quote, Hard to be God, 1989. I've seen so many movies. This is just a masterpiece above all. Must see before you die. Isn't Thank that you. the second plug for that? It is. He's a really big fan. And Nick, yeah. thanks for your question, says... Is a hidden God not indistinguishable from no God? I think that's for you, Sal. Oh, th thank you for the question. Uh, if it's hidden from uh, uh, your eyes, uh, I, I guess it wouldn't be indistinguishable. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I believe that it's not completely hidden. If it were completely hidden, we'd have no chance. But I think there is evidence, and that's what we're talking here today. And then additionally, like I said, a lot of people on my channel that are Christians uh, believe that they've witnessed miracles. So to them, God isn't hidden in, in, in their lives. Um, that does pose other theological problems. But, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, I can only represent my experiences that I, I believe I've seen miracles. And I believe I've talked to people who are credible witnesses, like astronaut Charles Duke, who healed a blind girl after praying in the name of Jesus. I would consider that um not so hidden. So gotcha. thank you for the question, Nick. And thank you very much. John W. for your question says, I am the only vet I know on here besides Sal and who else defends their home? When did your knowledge help or else for the country and being a man for it all, not just what you were doing? Huh. Um. Was that a question, or could you read yeah. it? I'll read it one more time. If you want to shake like, your head and go, what? I was that, I'll, I'll okay. shake with it. I was hoping you guys would, would have gotten it, because I didn't. John W. says, I am the only vet I know on here besides Sal. Ooh. And Ooh, who else defends veteran. their home? Sal, you got to, is that it? You got to, you big on oh, guns? Now, now it makes sense. I wanted to say, uh, John W., I think, uh, because you saw me in a pilot outfit, uh, you thought I was a veteran. I, I apologize. I think you showed up on my channel and thanked me for being a veteran. I'm not. I worked uh, as a defense contractor, and I also built machines to help veterans. Uh, I mean, active duty um, uh, soldiers and sailors and pilots, uh, both here and in Kuwait. So uh, along those lines, happy Memorial Day weekend to everyone, body, and I'd like to thank all the veterans who protected the United States in particular. Um, I'd like to just say thanks to them, uh, to the veterans. Most of them have passed away. Who liberated my mother's village in World War II? She lived in the Philippines, and the Japanese occupied it. And a lot of uh, very fine young men uh, died uh, so that she could live and we could be here. And uh, so, um, a blessed Memorial Day, a Memorial Day to all the families of our veterans. Thank another, you. Another thing we can agree on, Sal. Amen to that. Thank hey, you. Anybody thank you. Agreed. Anybody who has served, thank you so much for serving. We do appreciate it. And uh, yeah. we uh, initially, I, I thought he was thinking that the guy was saying that he was a veterinarian, and neither one of us are veterinarians. Oh, but then, me you know, so. now it makes sense. They said, When yeah. did your knowledge? So they, they asked, John W. had more of a question coming from that, said, When did your knowledge, I think they're referring to you, Sal, help or else? For the country and being a man for it all, not just what you are doing. I think maybe like they're saying what was like the broader, bigger thing for the country overall that you think you contributed. I'm not sure. Um, 
I kind of read the question a little differently, um, and I'll just give my take is that he asked, yeah. when did I get the knowledge to, um, or when did it start to help me? It was when I nearly left the Christian faith and I studied science. And then I've always been very patriotic for the reasons I stated, you know, when um, my mom uh, keeps telling me the story of um, when she was alive, of how wonderful it was to have her homeland liberated in her village. And um, that's why I value the freedoms we have in this country and what it's done. And uh, it's a glorious thing that uh, someone would lay down their lives to uh, liberate a third world country. And I'm eternally grateful for that. Gotcha. Although technically at the time it was a colony of the United States. Yes. Next up, this one coming in from, do appreciate it, Mick Ghost Lovin. Thanks for your awesome question, and I appreciate your question, uh, your name. They said, did God create Emery Iwana? I don't know what Emery Iwana is, but they said merely to tempt me. Sal, what are your thoughts? Oh, I, don't know I think he might be referring to that Mary Jane stuff. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. You're right. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Increasingly legal in many states, including my own in Colorado and other places. You you live in Colorado can... too? Hmm? Wait, you don't you don't live oh, in, I'm in Washington state? state. Oh, I'm okay. in Washington you're, state. You said and Colorado. Okay. We, we we passed an initiative here and Colorado did it there. Last time I was in Denver, the place was sprouting marijuana shops like dandelions in summer. Oh yeah. What are your well, thoughts, Sal? Um, that's a really good question. Why would God make marijuana? And I don't have an answer. I'm sorry. So um, I would presume all things were made uh, prior to the fall of man for our, our delight and pleasure. So this is so there could be a high church. Don't, don't say that. Uh, uh, don't take that as an endorsement to indulge in dr drugs now. So juicy. Uh, I'm not I, a pot I, smoker, so I don't have a, a, a dog in this hunt. You got it. And thank you for your question. Ian Chen is in the house, says, buy R.J. and Jackson's book, The Rocks Were There. Do it now. Gotcha. Thank you very much, Ian Chen. And also thank you very much for your question. This one coming in from John W. Says, I am Canadian. Thanks. That was the person who had just mentioned uh, that you guys are both vets. Thank you, John W., for being with us. And that goes for everybody. Folks, as always, want to let you know, Modern Day Debate, neutral debate platform we hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from i am not a veteran my no i i uh, narrowly missed going to vietnam in 1969 but my draft number was uh, um, too uh, high for that but no I, i'm not a veteran oh you bet you got it and then x florio thank you very much for your question says evolution ontologically would have to be a metaphysical mechanism but how can a metaphysical mechanism exist in an atheist materialist worldview? That for either one of them, I'll take it. Yep. <laughs> the the um, uh, ironically, in principle, an origins of life issue could still be a miraculous phenomenon, and then everything after that completely naturalistic evolution. That there's all sorts of options going on in here. Um, it. Mo if you are an atheist and you don't believe in magic spurgle gods that are meddling and designing stuff, then in principle, you do indeed need to work out how life managed to originate at some point. And it's an ongoing piece of research, an interesting one. None of that will make all the evidence for evolution after that go away. Gotcha. And um, thank you very yeah, much. Thanks for the question. I, I have no input. You got it. This one coming in. Oh, Sal had a comment. <laughs> I think, hold on, I might have missed one. I'm going to just quick scan, see that I got it. This next one coming in from, do appreciate your question, pro-social pessimist. This isn't per se regarding the biology in terms of intelligent design, but they're asking, why would God, Sal, why would God make so many parts of the earth inhospitable? Well, thank you for the question. I've never, I've actually never thought about that. Although, actually, one could say uh, there are, Many places in the universe, in fact, most places in the universe, are inhospitable. And so I would argue that the inhospitability is a pointer that we are special. We're, we live on a privileged planet. And I do think some parts of the Earth has become inhospitable because of after the fall. But the main point of the inhospitability of the universe in general is pointing that we are a very special place. 
in the universe. And a professor of mine, James Treckle, said everything we've le uh, learned recently or in the last 20 years when he wrote the book, uh, he said, I'm not a particularly religious man, but um, in light of everything we've learned in the last 20 years, uh, I'd say that uh, we are special in God's sight. Gotcha. Uh, I would That's argue that, inhospitability. that everywhere is inhospitable in some way or another. There are earthquakes, floods, uh, tornadoes, uh, locusts, um, plate tectonics, all of these things are happening so that there's very few places anywhere that are potentially idyllic and free from potential problem. The, the main thing is we as a species, going way back even before Homo sapiens into the Homo erectus, are extremely adaptable and diverse. And in the case, there's been several Andes in Tibet of where uh, natural mutations have uh, uh, led to a greater adaptation for extreme high altitude to where uh, regular folk who go up there are gasping for breath because of the lack of oxygen. But the thing has evolved since then and there's papers on the technical evolution of that. So um, everywhere is inhospitable unless we make it otherwise. That's the human thing. Gotcha, and Ian Chen says, congrats Sal on your published paper. Yes, it was more of a press release. Uh, it was in the FACID Journal, the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, uh, May 14th. We um, we talked about uh, a, a, a software implementation of an algorithm that was published in 2012. And the author of that algorithm, uh, Kirk Durston was actually on the team, were able to infer protein structure by doing cross-species analysis uh, like say we'll take a tope isomerase from a plant, we'll take it from a um, a dog or a human. We'll put this, we'll do a multiple sequence alignment. The evolutionary biologists know what I mean. We pump it through the algorithm. It can, um, algorithm, various algorithms can predict the 3D protein structure. And then our algorithm also predicts um, uh, chemical inter uh, possibility of chemical interactions. So that was a big deal to be God willing more publications yeah, uh, along that and line. Don't be surprised if evolutionists make use of it and come up with conclusions you may not like. Juicy Mike Q nine two two. Thanks for your question. Says, what are your thoughts on theistic evolution? Could it be either of you if you want to respond. Well, I'll, I'll go if Sal doesn't, or Sal, go ahead. Um, I think it's uh, we can argue against it on scientific grounds, and then it would be. If it fails scientifically, which I've tried to argue that it, at the very least it has problems that would preclude it from being accepted um, on the, the level, say, of electromagnetic theory, that then um, uh, until it, it gains really more traction as uh, and solved all these problems, there's no reason to accept it as truth. Um, certainly not, or not truth, certainly not gospel. Certainly not gospel. And I'll point out there's passages in the New Testament where Jesus turned water into wine. So to the extent that um, one sees problems in biology that are best solved by a miracle, then there's no need to invoke theistic evolution if you, if one already accepts uh, mir other miracles in the Bible. So those are my thoughts. Yeah, a theistic evolution suffers from some of the same problems that intelligent design and creationism do in that they aren't terribly good at working out a model that uh, if you look at Swamidas and various other people, that it starts getting foggy at the detail level. And you would like to know, well, what exactly, where, where was the God doing stuff in this particular sequence? And so it's all the same map of time modeling issue that's the, the difficulty. If you're comfortable, uh, theistic evolutionists are one that will be accepting more of the standard science and attempting to incorporate it into their theological perspective. Uh, your um, uh, and this uh, paleontologists, uh, uh, Robert Asher, various ones in that regard. Um, if they are much more finicky about which branches of the theology that they're um, willing to accept, that may preclude, in principle, uh, any form of evolution, theistic or otherwise. And and, and finally, Michael B. He might be considered. He's an intelligent design advocate. Uh, some people would consider him a theistic evolutionist, where there's universal common ancestry, but then some sort of design along the way. Yeah, Michael and, and, uh, and Gunter Beckley, they're all that uh, in principle accept a common ancestry. I will put it with the caveat, it's a meaningless concession in that they never apply it to anything. So it's just off there floating again as a thing. Oh, yeah, I accept that in this case, this case, this case, and then suddenly, boop, it's gone. 
Gotcha. And this question coming in from, we do appreciate it. Joshua Alec says, RJ, do you know what a protocell might have looked like or what structures would be required for something to be called a protocell? Ooh, very good question. Uh, I think if you look at the various researchers in the field, they need to have several things happening together as a unit, although not necessarily that each one of these things happen, happen all at once. It's going to have to have a metabolic system that's bringing energy into the thing to fuel it. That probably has to have occurred first. Otherwise, anything that develops replication, which is one of the other factors, is going to eat itself out of house and home. So I'm definitely a metabolism first person if it had a naturalistic origin. The third element definitely is the membrane system, which brings up the pores and all the little things that uh, Sal was alluding to in the videos, which is why they're, they're useful pieces of information to do up. And I will say this as a gauntlet issue, is that it's perfectly fine for Sal and intelligent designers and creationists to be throwing down these, well, you can't explain this and you can't explain this precisely because it acts as a prod to the scientific community to continue to do work in the field. Don't be surprised that they're going to continue to figure this out, but nonetheless, from that point of pot stirring, it's perfectly good to bring it up. So you've got membranes, you've got replication, and you have metabolism. Now, the one unanswered question that we have is, are there other answers to those systems than the ones that we know of that is inferred from the last universal common ancestor, LUCA, from which all organisms developed? And we don't know the answer to that. There may have been alternate versions, which they may well be encountering in abiogenesis work experimentally, that might have been dominant systems at one time or another, first 100 million years, and then fizzled out as a new competitor that eventually becomes LUCA. So there's still an awful lot that isn't known about this, but can I conceptualize the basic boundary layers? Yeah, and I think most abiogenesis people can, at least the ballpark of what needs to be done. Juicy, this one from Bubble Bubblegum Gun says, there are multiple gods, not just one and other entities. So stick that in your pipe and smoke it, Sal. Marduk, Marduk. What do you think, Sal? Uh, I have, uh, thank you for the comment i i do have a pipe and uh i like captain black tobacco you got it and we are pumped you guys as we've got maybe one more question that we can fit in and then also want to let you know oh baby you guys this debate coming up at 8 p.m eastern in other words about 55 minutes from now t jump and nathan thompson are going to collide on flat earth so it's gonna be juicy spoiler <laughs> alert the earth isn't flat it's going to be juicy. And, uh, Marshall, the meat prophet, thank you very much for your question, says, Sal, why do so many people have experiences of gods that are not the Christian God? Does God appear as Krishna, or are those people mistaken? If so, how do you know Christians aren't mistaken? We don't all, um, thank you for the question, and that is a, a very probing question. The, uh, uh, can you repeat the question? I, I do. This is a, such a good one. I want to try to do it justice. Roughly speaking, I'll summarize, like paraphrase it. So people have these other experiences of other gods like Krishna or whoever, whether it be near death experiences or maybe even just, you know, things that experience throughout their lives. And so if you would say that they're not real, well, then how do you know that people's experiences or alleged experiences of Jesus aren't real? Um, I don't think anyone in the ultimate sense or absolute sense can establish um, one way or the other. We accept certain things by faith. Like we do a lot of things in, in life, we have incomplete information. We make decisions on it. But I do acknowledge that other uh, people of other faiths have experienced miracles. The Christian answer to that is that um, if they are legitimately supernatural, that they are not of the Christian God. They are of the devil. And... Uh, that's why it was very important when Jesus was casting out demons that um, his miracles are better. So that's that's about the best response I can give. And thank From you a sociological point of view, I'll just say that the vast majority of people on the planet tend to believe whatever religion of their local group is. So people who are raised in a Christian environment believe in Christianity. People who come into a Hindu environment are believing in Hinduism and so forth and so on. Uh, but the one outlier group are Buddhists where a large proportion of Buddhists live in cultures where Buddhism is not the majority religion. 
Now, psychologically, individual people, some will be more attracted to the religion of the culture. Some will want to hunt their, their something that's invalid or inaccurate, or they, they get at the hypocrisy of it, and they settle on a religion that's an outlier group. And so there's a whole Pew research uh, uh, follows these kinds of things, uh, 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 so, uh, sociology of religion people. And it's a very interesting subject that as a non-believer is a fascinating thing. Why, why do people believe stuff and why do they end up with the particular beliefs they do? Gotcha. And this one coming from Steven Steen, nasty guy, says, I think this is directed toward you, RJ. Says, ooh, girl, ooh. don't you stop. Don't you stop till you get enough. Honey, ooh, honey, honey pie, honey, honey, honey pie. Oh, I think that is a song lyric, although I'm not familiar with it. I will counter with ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, tang, walla, walla, bing, bang. That's really hot, H-A-W-T. Uh, so we want to let you know, folks, our guests are linked in the description. We are thrilled. Want to let you know, we really do appreciate them. We are going to, I'm going to be hanging around here in between as we have our intermission leading up to the big debate tonight with Nathan Thompson and T-Jump, which is pictured right here on the bottom right of your screen. So, whew, baby, it's going to be epic. Want to say thank you, RJ and Sal. It's been a true pleasure to have you guys. I, I think it was a fun and informative discussion. I think it brought up an awful lot of interesting things I'm going to be looking into and all the rest. And uh, I, it's fun. doesn't matter to anything. We're just a video debate, but still, it was fun. You um, got it. Uh, and, and thank you, RJ, for suggesting um, the debate. I just got a, a letter from um, Mr. Coons here that uh, he wanted an opponent. And so uh, I got volunteered. And, oh, um, oh, I, I had a completely different understanding that he had set up a thing with the, with you on the debate. Are you are you trying to to edge us together, James? You know, coming along there like the person doing the movie thing, saying, "Hey, I've got uh, this big star in here. There's all settled," and you use that as bait to bring the other person in. Are you into that thing, James? That's funny. Believe me. I've thought about it, but no, <laughs> so, I, I can't remember. I'm trying to remember what I said to you guys. I know that I figured I was like, have you guys debated before? Because people always love new matchups. And so well, I we, we have it. interacted uh, in previous uh, circumstances. Yeah, you know. I, I just wanted to say I don't have your email, um, RJ. Oh, um, oh, let me get uh, um, if uh, and, in the ch in the private chat window, I'll stick my email in there. And, and the reason I'm saying that is out of courtesy. I am inviting you to my 9 p.m. show on the history of ID and creationism. It's I'm not arguing whether it's right or wrong. It's just the history. What 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 time is that? At 9 p.m. So you can. Oh, I may on, be uh, otherwise engaged, so okay. I have to view it afterwards. But anyway, email once the show is done. Then because I can always comment on it in the in the stream afterwards. Yeah, uh, so I just out of cool, but you, uh, I wanted you, to. You see my email in there? Yes, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna grab it right now. And yeah. uh, so speaking of which, at 9 p.m., I'm having a show on my channel on the history of creationism, intelligent design, creation science, et cetera. And um, I did try to invite uh, people like Gutzik Gibman and yeah. uh, Dr. Dan. Uh, at my own website, they'll find the tip 1.6 and 1.7 are um, history and commentary on creationism from its um, uh, main roots uh, in the early 20th century and then the intelligent design movement and its uh, uh, interactions up to the Dover trial. So uh, that's another shameless plug from my website. You got it. And, so, uh, thank you, everybody. 100%. Yeah, everybody stay safe. We're still not out of the woods on COVID. The little bastards mutate. You got it. And so we want to say thank you, Sal, and thank you, RJ. We'll be back in a moment, folks, with a post credit scene, or you could say an intermission. And thanks so much for being with us. We're excited for this upcoming debate in 48 minutes. Be right back in just a moment.